Hello and welcome to the European Report. Uh, my name's Simon Barrett and this programme was filmed at a conference organised by Christians for Israel in the Netherlands in cooperation with the European Coalition for Israel on Israel boycott, divestment and sanctions and international law. Well, it's, it's good to be in the Netherlands and, uh, <clears throat> as you know, one of the uh, strongest members of the European Coalition for Israel has always been Christians for Israel, based in the Netherlands. And uh, as Christians for Israel and Andrew Tucker decided to have this very important and timely conference on the BDS movement, we decided that uh, we would do the European report from, from the Netherlands this time. And I think it was a, it was a good, good decision. And considering that Simon, Simon Barrett is, a, is away this week, last year we've been discussing uh, in the European report about the forthcoming elections. Uh, for many of us, the fear was there that this would be a, a breakthrough for many far-right parties into the European Parliament. And uh, sadly, uh, this is what happened. I think the good news is that uh, Nick Griffin, the um, British neo-Nazi that uh, is an openly Holocaust denier, he was not re-elected. That's the good news. The bad news is that he was uh, replaced by many more neo-fascists from Greece, from Hungary, from Germany, from Bulgaria, but, but also from, from other nations. And obviously this is a, a matter of concern for us, for anyone that believes in, in the European project, that believes that Europe should not go back to where we were in the 1930s. Um, of course, as I have said that, I think it's always good to differentiate and say not every party that is against uh, more European integration is automatically populist or racist or or, or anti-Semitic, far from it. So I believe uh, one could even say that uh, part of this protest could be uh, a positive one. And um, it's, it's too early to tell exactly how, say, the, the UKIP, UK Independence Party, uh, other, other parties which are considered uh, populist, how they will position themselves on issues which are important to us, but also issues that are of, of broader importance, say racism, xenophobia, uh, so on and so forth. But um, um, although uh, we accept the fact that you can be very critical of the EU and still you're a legitimate democratic voice, I think there are um, enough substance for us to be really concerned. And we are then thinking especially about um, two countries, uh, Greece and, and Hungary, the Golden Dawn and Jobbik, where I think there is no question whatsoever uh, what these uh, parties represent. Uh, again, when you look at, at France and the National Front, of course, it's a, it's a matter of concern to have the National Front take 25% of the electorate. Um, personally, I'm, I'm very skeptic, I'm, I'm very critical uh, to the party leader. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, possible for a daughter to distance herself from the party uh, founder, Jean-Marie Le Pen. And, and, and I think Jean-Marie Le Pen has been so clear where he stands on issues which are critical and central to all, all Europeans, to, to neglect the importance of the Holocaust, to call it a, a mere detail of history. I think it's, it's um, disgusting. And, and his uh, recent uh, uh, quote to say that, you know, by uh, this, this particular virus, in, in, um, we could, we could um, prevent African immigration coming into to Europe in a very natural way. I think that's, that's really disgusting. So, so, yes, there are real concerns for what is going on in Europe. The European Coalition for Israel, together with Christians for Israel, organized a conference today here in Holland on the subject of international law and the BDS movement, boycott, divestment and sanctions. And we organised the conference for the general public, at least those who are connected with our organisations, just to inform them about what is the BDS movement, what is international law, how does it work? 
because we find that so many people talk about international law and it seems to be commonplace that people say, well, the, the settlements are illegal, Israel should withdraw from the occupied territories, uh, there needs to come a Palestinian state, um, and Israel is criticised on the basis of international law to the extent that even its, its, uh, its legality as a state is even put in question. And so we thought it was important to go back with some experts and look at these questions from different angles, um, even if we don't come to final answers, so that people are more aware of, of what's going on. I spoke earlier here in the conference and I said that Israel is facing three uh, major threats in Europe right now. The first is the uh, return of, of the jihadists on Syria that are coming in now in, in hundreds in, in Europe and the security threat that they are posing. Uh, the second, of course, is the rise of the far right, of the, uh, the new anti-Semitism in Israel, and, and uh, seeing the election results, it only confirms uh, our fears for the last uh, year or, or year and a half. But thirdly, and, and interestingly, I see this as the most um, um, challenging issue to deal with is the BDS. Uh, sometimes I call it sophisticated uh, uh, anti-Semitism, because these are people who speak the language of human rights and, and, and uh, righteousness and justice. But when you really look into it, many of them are motivated by the same deadly virus as Jobbik and um, the Golden Dawn in Greece. They don't like to hear about it, of course. But when you look a little bit uh, behind their, their arguments, their uh, fierce opposition of any Jew living in the disputed territories, what we would call the heartland of, of Israel, uh, looking at, at proportionality, how they can uh, put all this energy into to demonizing the Jews living in the disputed territories, uh, accusing them of all sorts of wrongdoings when they would pay no attention to what happens in, in other trouble spots in the world. Of course, that cannot be justified to say that it's a human rights issue. It's not. And, and I think this is, um, our, um, this is our job as ECI really to, to take on this battle. It's, this is not a military battle, it's, it's nothing of that sort, but it's a battle of ideas. And here we need to become better advocates of Israel. We need to know the facts uh, and the international law facts. And that's why this conference in particular was so helpful to have um, law professors here and, and journalists here speaking about these issues. BDS movement claims that uh, Israel is illegally occupying Palestinian territory and that it has created there uh, Jewish settlements, which also are, according to the BDS movement, by definition, uh, illegal. So the, the, the presuppositions are uh, strongly worded in legal terms. Um, they are using international law as their kind of weapon in, in, in the lawfare against Israel. And the BDS is uh, referring time and again to the uh, advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice of 2004, where indeed it was said that the territories are occupied and that the settlements are illegal but in my view not correct. The BDS movement argues, in fact it's based on the idea that the Jews living in the so-called occupied territories are doing so illegally. The settlements are illegal. And they base that upon international law. The Fourth Geneva Convention is the primary uh, tool and that is uh, the law that applies to occupied territories. They say, first of all, those territories are occupied territories in the sense of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Secondly, the Fourth Geneva Convention prohibits states from transferring their population into the occupied territory. So they say on the first case, these are occupied territories because Israel took them in 1967 in a war situation. They even go on to say that's illegal. And secondly, by Israelis, going to move into that area, they are inf effectively taking over the West Bank. That's the kind of thinking, and that's conflicting with, um, with Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Now, um, there's a number of 
problems with that argument. Um, if you look at it on the on the the negative side, um, the Fourth Geneva Convention was never intended to apply to this kind of situation. The, the Fourth Geneva Convention came into existence in 1949 after the Second World War. It was all about the way Germany and Russia moved their populations into huge areas of Europe to ethnically cleanse areas. We've seen in Romania, Poland, Ukraine and these kinds of areas. Now what's happening in Israel is completely different. The Jews who've gone to live in eastern Jerusalem and in the areas of Judea and Samaria haven't gone there because they've been forced to. They haven't gone there in order to get rid of the Arabs. They've gone there from a conviction that they belong there. It's a very different thing. So there's a strong case to be made that the Fourth Conven Geneva Convention is not really even applicable. But secondly, even if it is, there's nothing illegal about occupation. It's not illegal to occupy territory that has been uh, legitimately won in a conflict situation. Um, what is illegal is to transfer your, your population into that area, and as I say, that's not what Israel uh, has, has done. So th they're using this as a kind of technique or tool. Now, the interesting thing is that um, people tend only to look at the State of Israel from 1948, even from 1967 onwards. It's all about the human rights of the Palestinians. But what we forget is that the whole State of Israel was based on a history going way back to 1920 and even earlier, when the Ottoman Turkish Empire fell and the, uh, the, uh, the mandates were created and the basis was laid for the Jewish people to, to have their homeland in all of Palestine, which includes what we call the West Bank today and all of Jerusalem. And those agreements, those treaties, that mandate and the decisions made at San Remo form really the legal basis or constitution, if you like, of the State of Israel, which came into existence after the Second World War in 1948. So the State of Israel doesn't depend on resolutions of the UN. It doesn't depend upon the, um, the acceptance in, in the UN. It depends on those earlier uh, agreements, which go way back to Israel's earlier existence uh, in those areas. And that includes the West Bank, the so-called occupied territories. So Israel has a strong claim to these territories and in a way it's a pity that Israel has never really fully um, embraced those claims. It's never fully expressed them. My advice would be to the Israeli government is to stress more maybe than they are used to do the uh, birth certificate of the Jewish state, I say the mandate, and the rights given to the state of Israel and to the Jewish people, and uh, to the Jewish people to establish a, uh, a Jewish national home in the territory of the mandate. And by stressing that the territories, which are, uh, uh, say, the focus of the conflict, are not by definition occupied and that the people living there are not to be seen as illegal settlers. Of course, the Israeli government may feel inclined to come to some sort of agreement, but then they should not do so from uh, the idea that they are there by defi definition illegal. No, they are, as a sovereign state, negotiating with another party to come to some sort of peaceful settlement, because also the Israeli government recognized rights of Palestinians under the Oslo Agreement, but the, 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 the precise uh, configuration of the future uh, situation is to be negotiated. As uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu also said last year in the UN General Assembly, their view is that there will be established a Palestinian demilitarized state in the territory. He was not defining precisely the borders, that is part of the negotiations. And uh, so the, the Israeli government should reject, reject the idea that they are by definition there illegally. No, they are not. And that the Jewish people that are living there are there illegal. No, they are not. Under the mandate, Article 6, the Jewish people has the right to settle in the mandate territory. Um, I think what is, what is sad and, and uh, worrying at the same time is that 
The eve of the elections were marked by this brutal killing in, in Brussels, just a few blocks away from the European Parliament. And, and I think this will mark um, at least the next year in a very particular way. And, and uh, the pressure also on the European institutions to do something, not just to neglect it or, or, or dismiss it, but to, to really look into how could this happen is, is something that we have to work together with, uh, with the positive uh, friends of Israel in the European Parliament. Uh, and I think there are a number of issues that will have to be raised. Um, we know, for example, this was not, uh, we spoke earlier about the far right, the rise of the far right. This was not a skinhead, it was not an extreme right, it was not a Yobik or any other party sympathizer. This was a returning jihadist from Syria living in France. <clears throat> and um, I believe that uh, the returning jihadists from Syria, they're now coming back in hundreds, uh, radicalized, motivated to kill, uh, and trained and equipped to do so is something that really poses a, a new type of threat to the security, not only of, of Jewish people and Jewish targets, but um, anyone who, uh, who believes in, in, in Western values. I think the EU Parliament should take the case of Israel seriously. Sometimes you have the idea that at least strong uh, currents within the uh, EU Parliament are strongly in favor of a BDS-like approach, but I think there may be others, and I th I'm sure there are others, who will stress, yes, of course, there are humanitarian interests of Palestinians, we should take into account their rights, and uh, we hope and will work for a peaceful settlement, but never uh, lose uh, the interest, uh, uh, never uh, overlook the interest of the state of Israel and the Jewish people to live in safety and in peace in the country of their forefathers in, in, the, in, the, in the state of Israel. And uh, so I, I think also the right of Israel to protect itself against uh, violence, against terrorism, against the threat of maybe foreign states should be uh, uh, recognized uh, and valued by the European Parliament. It should be stressed. They should realize the state of Israel is a democratic state. It uh, respects the rule of law. They have an independent judiciary. And in that respect, of course, the state of Israel differs from many states in the Middle East. And that should be uh, valued and uh, uh, estimated by the European Parliament, which always says, well, we are in favor of democracy and the rule of law, human rights. Well, they can see how uh, these things are uh, uh, working in the state of Israel, and uh, they should support Israel, especially when it comes to it's under a growing threat of some states in the world and of terroristic organizations. And while also, at the same time, we see that the Jewish people in other parts of the world are uh, frequently also the victim of, of all kinds of, of, of attacks in nowadays. And my opinion of anti-Semitism today is uh, very much influenced by my uh, encounters and uh, with uh, Jewish fellow citizens uh, in Strasbourg, in Brussels, in the Netherlands. And uh, we should be alert because they said to me, it is becoming a part of our daily life. The normalization of anti-Semitism in European daily life. And that is a big, big danger. We should underestimate and we should uh, encounter it together. My concern is again uh, the signs of BDS in uh, real life. When I'm going to my green grocer, I learn again and again the story that there are customers coming in his shop and are asking that fruit, where does it come from? This come from for Israel, do thank you. And then he asks them why they have no answer. So it is, I think they have no, it is, I'm afraid that is the influence of the media, bashing Israel and then so having a kind of uh, non-reflecting attitudes to be against Israel. And that is very, uh, uh, I must say, uh, de uh, depressing.
What we've seen in the Netherlands in recent months, uh, even perhaps even the last couple of years, but certainly the last few months of this year, 2014, uh, has been a, a strong development of the BDS movement. And it's a kind of interaction between the government policy and the way that businesses are acting and NGOs. The NGOs, there's a number of large uh, publicly financed NGOs in the Netherlands, Pax Christi, ICO, these kinds of organisations, publicly funded, which have an anti-Israel agenda. They take the position uh, that Israel is illegally occupying. And they're doing everything they can to lobby the government and businesses to boycott. The government took the position of um, discouraging businesses. It was a positive policy to discourage businesses to invest in the Netherlands. And we saw a number of uh, companies in the Netherlands withdrawing their activities from uh, Israel. And one of them was PGGM, a big pension fund, which was investing in five Israeli banks. They uh, stopped those investments. It's not about a huge amount of money, some 60, 70 million uh, euros, which in their total portfolio is not a lot, but it's a significant political statement. And they did that because they were convinced uh, about the illegality um, of Israel's activities. And another of other companies, which did so under pressure from the uh, Dutch government. And this interaction between uh, the government and the NGOs and businesses is having a huge impact because the danger is that other companies will start to follow. If the general perception is that Israel is illegal, therefore we should follow suit. So I think it's a very dangerous uh, development and fortunately there seems to be a strong voice coming from the Christian community in the Netherlands putting the case on strong legal and historical grounds why this is unacceptable. Um, now, if you look at Europe generally, I think the Netherlands is actually at the forefront of the BDS movement. There's a couple of other countries, if you look at Norway, Sweden, which are also a little bit down this track as well. But uh, my concern would be if the Netherlands is in a way taking the lead and other countries will, will follow suit. So I'm hopeful that there will come now a kind of um, momentum of organisations and people who are strong enough to put the case on behalf of Israel and, and convince their governments that the BDS movement is unacceptable. Now it's it's time to really engage and to um, to do what we did also in, in Finland um, a little bit more than a year ago and I'm, I'm a little bit proud about what happened because there you had the church development organisations um, encouraging their uh, supporters to um, ask for divestments from um, any company that, that would have activities in the disputed territories. And, and when we realized that, we said, well, listen, many of our supporters are also supporters of this Christian charity. And we said, well, if you disagree with them, uh, you should let them know this is how democracy works, this is how an open society works. Uh, send them a note, uh, pick up the phone or send an email. And, and they did so in, in such great numbers. So uh, the, this particular organization is still talking about it, how, how it blocked their telephone, it blocked their emails, and, and they got completely you know, freaked out. What's, what's going on here? But it, also, it, it, it only shows the, the, the power of um, simple things that we can do. And all of us, without exception, can write an email. And all of us are important. And I think we, we so often um, underestimate our own value, what it means, uh, both in, in the positive and the negative. I mean, the positive that we send a note of encouragement to our member of parliament, that we say that we pray for him, we support him. Um, but also, if we disagree with something, we have the same right, living in a democracy, to say, listen, we disagree with this. If, if, if I'm a Christian, and a Christian charity is all of a sudden starting all these campaigns demonizing Israel. Uh, I will tell that charity to say, but as, as for my money, I will put that el elsewhere. You know, if I want to support something in a developing country, I'll go to an organization uh, with uh, whose values I agree. And, and um, uh, you know, there's nothing 
strange or, or um, illegitimate about that. And I think as, as uh, citizens, we should always use our voice, our vote, but, but also our, our um, um, ability to, to shape opinions.